Good morning, Singing Oaks, and good morning to everyone who's with us online today. Welcome. We're really glad that you're with us. I just want to remind you here at the beginning to go ahead and hit that share button so as many people as possible can be with us today as we worship God, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, and that our, ho our hope that we have in him. Also today we have uh, something special. The group New Rain is with us, and so we're really looking forward to worshiping with them and hearing them today as they sing. You know, I think all of us know that this has been a very tough week, and many people are hurting. And the scripture says that we should mourn with those who mourn. So today, we mourn with our black brothers and sisters because of the pain, because of the suffering, and because of the injustice that they have experienced, not only in this time, but over many years. We want you to know that we stand by you and with you today as we try to understand what you've gone through and what you continue to go through every day. You know, the Bible says that we are the body of Christ. And in the body, each member is important and each member belongs to all the others. We belong to each other today as we worship, as we try to support one another and care for one another. We serve a God who's a big God and he can both receive our praise and hear our cry. I want to read from Psalm 89, verse 14 and 15 today. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. Let's go to God in prayer as we get ready to worship. Dear God, we just thank you today for your righteousness, your justice, your love, and your faithfulness. We praise you and proclaim those great traits that you have and for your wonderful name. Lord, we thank you for the light. We thank you for the light that you are in this time of darkness. We thank you and ask you to help us as we be that light to the world. Lord, we pray today for peace. We pray for for justice, we pray for reconciliation, forgiveness. Lord, we pray for understanding. We pray today that your kingdom come and that your will be done in this place through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Those of you guys watching with us, uh, such a blessing to be here. It's, it's um, so I'm so glad to have uh, New Rain um, here with us, um, helping us lead worship, um, helping us um, see the bigger picture, um, and help us understand God deeper and deeper. So we thank New Rain for being here. We're going to join together in worship. So if you're watching with us, let us all join together in singing. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor.
solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love, in justice, you will reign. Hey, lift your voice. And every knee will bow. We bring our expectations. Our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. Take it up. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious, we lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus, from age to age you reign. Jesus, from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king Lift your voice. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. Sing, you are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Amen. So won't you sign me up? Sign me Sing with us. For the Christian Jubilee. Won't you write my name? Christian Jew. 
you are amazing. You love us even when we can't love ourselves. God, you give us grace and mercy. God, teach us grace and mercy. Teach us love. Teach us to love like you. God, in this time, these are difficult times, but we know that we can make it through you, through your spirit. God, make us more like you. Less of us, more of you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. morning. This is communion. Today's scripture reading will be from Mark 14, 22 to 24 and John 13, 2 through, through 5. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave the cup to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood, the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. John 13, 2 through 5. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water to a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This scripture, both of these scriptures are amazing, just amazing to me. Number one, Mark talks about the Lord's Last Supper with his disciples. He talks about breaking the bread, which is his body, drinking the wine, which was his blood. And after that, it even goes into showing how our beloved Christ Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Our master washed his disciples' feet. And you ask yourself, why is that such an amazing act by Christ Jesus? And I'll tell you why, just real quick. Each of those disciples all had sins, all dealt with problems, all had something that they had to bring to Christ Jesus. You had one who was Judas who was looking at murdering our Christ our, our beloved Christ Jesus, you had one doubting Thomas who didn't believe. You had one who, a few that would run away and run off and hide when our Christ died. And then you either had his beloved, beloved Peter who, who was uh, uh, all type of different issues he was dealing with. One, unfortunately, was uh, prejudice amongst the Gentiles. You ask, who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles was all of us. Uh, it was black, white, Latino, Asian, all different races. And yet, when he sat and ate with the Gentiles, who were not Jews, when his Jewish brothers came, he got up and moved and Paul had to call him out for that, almost call him a hypocrite because this is not what the church, the body of Christ, Christ's kingdom is all about. And when I see Christ Jesus knowing these things and as he's still washing their feet, I ask myself, Christ, there's a lot of things that were going on during your time, blessed master. A lot of things. That's why you came. Because there was a lot of things going on during this time. And yet, Christ, those who would turn against you, you still kneeled down and you washed their feet. And as time goes on, I try to understand, Christ, I, I, I'm a part of your body. I, I have my own opinions. I have my own thoughts. But I, I, what do I do? during this time of suffering because you suffered Christ you suffered for us what do I do in Christ Jesus just to sum it all up real quick here he gave us the perfect he gave us the perfect answer he says when one part of the body suffers we all suffer so you take your opinions and I take my opinions and I take my thoughts and I, and I see my brothers Suffering. I see my sisters suffering because of injustice or suffering because of wrong was done from one brother to another. 
And I said, Christ, I, I'm going to remove this, my certain thoughts, my opinions. And you're right. I am going to suffer with my brother. And I am going to suffer with my sister as you did. And I, and I pray that when Christ sees that, as I take the blood and the bread and his body, I pray that as Christ sees that, he says, Byron, thank you for giving me water to drink. And I say, Christ, wait, Father, what? when did I give you water to drink, beloved Christ Jesus? You gave me water when someone was in need of water. So you gave me water to drink. And then he looks at me. I pray that Christ looks at me and he says, thank you, Byron. Thank, thank you for what, Christ? For giving me food to eat. And I asked Christ, I said, Christ, when did I give you food to eat, Father? I don't, when? I, I beloved Jesus, Master, when, Father? When did I give, you gave me food to eat when someone was in need of food to eat. You gave it to me. And then I pray that Christ looks at me and he says, Byron, thank you for picking up the cross and carrying it for me. Because I was suffering and I'm in pain and I was hurt. And I asked Christ Jesus, when did I ever pick up the cross, Father? Uh, when did I pick your son's cross up? And Jesus says, you picked the cross up because you saw a brother or a sister down suffering in pain. You saw him hurting in pain. And when you picked up your brother and you picked up your sister, you picked me up and you carried my cross to the mountaintop so that I can die for all of you. And I just, I just look at Christ and I just pray and I say, thank you, Father. Thank you for sending your son. Let us pray. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to you at this time to thank you for the many blessings you give us every single day. Dear Lord, we ask that you please unite us as one, just like we're one with you forever and ever. Dear Lord, we also come at this time to please bless everyone who's suffering, going through cancer or some type of disease. Lord, we ask that you please make everything normal and how they were so we can see one another again. But Lord, just know that even with you allowing COVID-19 to enter our lives, there has been some pros. One of the pros are spending time with family, getting to know one another, and also just restarting your life and thinking about all the blessings you've given us day to day. Dear Lord, we do ask that you please bless the people who do have COVID-19 or who suffering with unemployment or anything going on with their lives. Lord, we know that you'll handle it and take us under your wing like you do day to day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls, and happy to be here with you this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Berkeley McDonald, and I am the children's ministry intern this summer. I'm really excited because today we have with us Lydia from the Bible. Thank hey. you for being here. Thank you, Berkeley, for asking me. I'm excited to be here. I have a question for you. How did you become a Christian? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question, Berkeley. That is the question that changed my life. It's a time in my life when I was at the river questioning how, um, how my life was going to play itself out. I was a seller of purple cloth, so I went down to the river frequently to get the cloth ready, to make it, to dye it there. I had lots of people there helping me. Um, but one day, Paul showed up. And he talked about something uh, that changed my life. And I had been someone who had sold purple cloth to people to make them feel important. They put it on and they thought they were somebody special. But I knew because I had made it, there wasn't anything that special about that cloth. And I wanted something in my own life that I could put on that would make me feel special. And I searched for that in a lot of different places. But when Paul came and talked about something that we could clothe ourselves in that would make us white as snow, I wanted to know what that was. And what he told me is that it was Jesus and his blood. And not just that it would change me from the outside, but that it would change me on the inside too. And so that's how I became a Christian. As soon as he told me that, I gave my life to Jesus, and I told everyone in my household about it, too. Wow. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to sing some songs. So I'm going to have some friends come up here and sing with me. Sorry. Respect 
God's name. Remember to worship every day. Remember, Remember to, to worship, worship every day. Obey your mom and dad. Obey your mom and dad. No killing. No killing. Stay with the one you're married to. Stay, Stay with the one you're married, married to. to. No stealing. No stealing. No lying. No lying. And don't want other people's things. And don't want other, other people's things. things. The fruit of the spirit is not a mango. Mango, do the tango. The fruit of the spirit is not a mango. Mango, do the tango. If you want to be a mango, mango, do the tango. You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit. Of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Hey, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh. The fruit of the spirit's not a Georgia peach. Georgia peach. The fruit of the spirit's not a Georgia peach. Georgia peach. If you want to be a Georgia peach, Georgia peach, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit because the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Hey, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The fruit of the spirit is not an apple. An apple a day keeps a doctor away. The fruit of the spirit is not an apple. An apple a day keeps a doctor away. If you want to be an apple, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit because the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Coconut. The fruit of the spirit is not a coconut. Coconut. If you want to be a coconut, coconut, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit because the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Hey, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Oh.
sad, hurt, and suffering. I've been inundated with the pain I hear from my fellow congregational members, the suffering I see in the world, the brutality that exists. I've been angry. I'm hurt. I'm hurting right alongside many of you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul gives us all a very clear message. I'm going to read it to you now. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have gifts of prophecy and I can fathom everything in this world, all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and I have the faith that can move a mountain, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, if I give over my body to hardships, that I boast. But do not have love, I gain nothing. What is love? It is patient. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects. Always trusts. Always hopes. And listen to me, folks. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Keep reading. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the childish ways behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully as I become fully known. Now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, the greatest of these is love. My fellow Christians, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me from the beginning to the end. Don't sound bite me. You can cast your judgment when I'm done. Don't dismiss part of what I'm saying. Don't let your pain, your hurt, Your heart allow what I'm about to say to get between you and me. Before I start my sermon, you need to know something. If you know me, you know I love you. If you don't know me, you don't know me. And I don't know you. You need to know that what I'm about to say comes from the heart. That what I'm about to say hopefully comes from the Bible. I want to pray with you together. The Lord's Prayer. Hopefully you're going to see that on your screen. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our, our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. 
and forgive us our trespasses the same way we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation, Father, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you need to know, back in March when we started this pandemic and things transitioned at this church, the ministry team sat down and we prayed together and we talked together and we looked ahead at what was coming from our eyes to see the future as best we could of what our church needed to hear. And we did that by looking at the past and seeing where our church had failed and where our church had struggled. We looked at the diversity of our church, the fact that the blessing of the diversity, the blessing that we have young, that we have old, that we have male and female, black, brown, white, Asian, we have every race. And it's a blessing. And we sat down and we talked and we decided that the thing we needed to do was stick with the vision God had gave us. And the vision that God had been given us was out of Ephesians 4. And he talks about how, and we're going to get to that scripture later, he talks about how we're diverse, we're not the same, we're varied people. But we're seeking unity in the faith. And the way that we seek that here, the way that we've been doing that here is by trying to understand this concept of loving God and loving others we call be the end. That we're in the middle, that God we love and others we love. And that's the middle we're going to be in because we're called to do the hard things in life. We're called to do the difficult things in life. And so in March we planned this sermon series all the way up till today. And last week's sermon on reconciliation was planned in March. As though God knew what he was doing. We didn't decide on that sermon last week because of the events. We decided on that sermon because God had been preparing us for what was coming. And today, today's sermon is about what Christians do in culture. And I say in culture because we're supposed to be in culture and not of culture. We're supposed to go in to our culture with the love of God. We can't put our heads in the sand and act like nothing's going on. The book of Peter, and you don't see this on your screen because I didn't put it in the slides, but it says this. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that they may malign you as evildoers. They may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. you got to be visible. Talked to a lot of people this week. I've been all over the internet, like many of you have. I listen to as many sources from as many sides as possible. I talk to my brothers and sisters at this church. I talk to my parents. I talk to my brothers and sisters bio biologically. I talk to my neighbors. I talk to as many people as possible. And I listen. I sit in counseling sessions this week and I listen. For those of you who don't know, I have degrees in ministry and counseling, and I have them for a reason, because psychology and theology try to run opposite of each other. They try to rip each other apart. Science tries to tear the church down and the Bible down, and sometimes the Bible tries to do the same thing to science. I'm called to reconcile that, to not let that be a division amongst our people. This week, though, this week we reconcile something else. Matthew 19, 13. Jesus has been doing ministry. He's been working with all sorts of people groups. It's been going on a while. He's got his disciples around him. His disciples that we know later on are still going to want to wage wars, 
wage war against other humans. We know that right as Jesus goes to the cross, that Peter is going to try to take up the sword and destroy the adversary, destroy the enemy, cut the ear off the soldier that's trying to take, to take the oppressor and oppress. We know that's coming. And in the middle of all of the things that could be going on in Jesus' life, in the middle of the Roman Empire, in the middle of not aligning with the Jewish thought of the day, but being a teacher in the law, in, a, in the middle of a, a group of people that hated so much Samaritans, people of mixed race, in a culture where voting happened all the time, where people were elected to office. Matthew 19, 13. Then the people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Now, we're going to pause for a second because you need to understand something. You can't ma imagine that in our culture today. You can't imagine that in our culture today because our culture looks at kids as little gods. We serve them. We do. That's how we see our children. We care more about our children than about God a lot of times. Amen? You don't want to amen it, but it's true. So we can't even imagine this scenario right here. Well, I'm going to try to get your brain there for just a second. But you've got to understand something. Kids back then weren't anything until they became something. And the type of kids that are coming to Jesus right now, we know a little bit about them. You're going, Bo, there ain't nothing else about them. I'll go, well, you ain't paying attention to Scripture. Read on. Jesus says this in verse 14. He says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now, has Jesus said that before? Has that been in the scripture anywhere before? Well, actually it has. If you go back to his original sermon in Matthew chapter 5, he says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, is Jesus lying? Is he saying only poor people get to be in heaven at that point? No. He's telling you that in that moment, those kids who are coming there that are marginalized by society, who are being rejected by the disciples at that point because they still can't see what Jesus is going to do. They're important. Now, are they more important than all the other Christians out there? No. But they don't feel important. They don't feel a part of. They're not in the conversations. They're not a part of the discussions because they're just kids. Poor in spirit. This passage, this passage is what compelled me into youth ministry. Because as a kid, I meant nothing in the church. No one asked my opinion, they told. No one cared my thoughts. And you've seen it out there online. Some kids say some really amazing things. Kids get marginalized. Kids, lives matter. I ain't going to argue with that, are you? But as soon as somebody says the phrase, black lives matter, you feel pain. Why? I'm going to tell you why you feel pain when you hear that. Because you want to say all lives matter. And if you're honest, like I'm about to be honest with you, all lives do not matter. All lives do not matter. Did Osama bin Laden's life matter? Does Trump's life matter? Does Candace Owens' life matter? Do the hundreds of people that have died this past week in this country's lives matter? Do the thousands of people overseas who are refugees in Syria, do their lives matter? Does the terrorists' lives matter? Does the rapist life matter? Does the other hurt people in this world who do very horrible things, do their lives matter to you? No, they don't. You don't talk about them. You don't come in here and cry about them. 
you try to hide behind a phrase like all lives matter. Do aborted babies' lives matter? Can't hide behind that phrase, folks. The world has a spiritual problem. And the world is trying to solve that problem with physical solutions. Racism still exists. The world does not know God. And if you do not know God, you cannot know love. And if you cannot know love, then all you can know is to like and love people like you. That is racism. When you hear somebody say black lives matter, black lives matter. Byron's life matters. BJ's life matters. Nick's life matters. Jabari's life matters. Crystal's life matters. I could go through everybody in our church. Barbara's life matters. Zeke's life matters. James and Jordan, who live down the street from me, their life matters. The other Zeke who lives down the street from me, his life matters. Rodney, who lives across the street from me, his life matters. My kids know their life matters to me. But do those other people know that? You see, as the world is out there right now trying to solve their problems with fleshly solutions, they will fail. They always fail. This is why it keeps coming up over and over and over again. Heart problems cannot be solved with flesh solutions. If you have love... If you don't have love, you have nothing. Do you believe the scripture? When you're on Facebook and you're posting your wisdom and your thoughts about this movement or that movement or this side or that side, are you doing that in love? Are you communicating that love in that post? You have nothing. Ephesians 2 says this. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. This is the time to do good works. I'm telling you, in March, when we were planning this stuff, we weren't thinking this. We weren't sitting where we are today when we were planning, but God was planning. He was setting us up to do the good works. It's our opportunity to do the good works. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge. As a guy locked up in jail right now, for God, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit. By being bound to peace. There is only one body. And that's another problem we got here in the U.S. Because we don't think that. We don't believe that. We don't act that. We don't like something somebody does. Go to the church down the road. That's not one body thinking. There's one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope, and when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Each of us has been given grace, apportioned by Christ. And this is what it says. When God ascended to high, he took captives with him, and he gave gifts to his people. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave us. He gave us as a church. He gave us as a church. He says, some apostles, people to guide us, direct us, to help us understand what he was talking about. Some prophets, the ones that say, hey, what's coming? What you're doing and what's coming? It's not going to work out for you. What you're doing, what's coming, it's going to be great. People to provide us hope and also to chastise us when we're headed down the wrong path. The evangelist, those who, who can reach into the heart of others and find that God spot and pull it out and show them God's love. 
the pastors, the comforters, the ones that, that, that in times of despair, in times of loss, in times of death. I don't go to a funeral and tell people, God, I can't believe people do this. I don't go to a funeral and tell people, well, that guy screwed up. That's why he's dead. If, if I got a call and it said, come do George Floyd's funeral, I'd be sad. I am sad. I'm not going to go to his funeral and say, well, here's all the ways he screwed up in life. I'm going to go to his funeral and I'm going to say, man, I am sorry for his loss. I, I wonder what God was doing with him. I wonder what God's plan was for him. How God was going to redeem him and was redeeming him to save people that can't hear my voice. Because they're not in a place where they can listen to my skin color talk. Or they're not in a place where they can listen to my gender talk. He gave us pastors to love us. To be with us in times of trial. To sit next to us in our pain and tell us we are loved. And he gave us teachers. And teachers equip us. Teachers help us know what questions to ask. They help us to see diverse sides. They help us to understand the broader thing of what's going on because, guys, we can't understand it all. It's too complicated. But he didn't do that for nothing. He didn't do that without a purpose. He didn't do that and just say, hey, it says this. He did it to equip his people for works of service. And not just works of service like our world thinks about niceties and doing something nice for this or something nice for that. But works of service designed to build the body of Christ up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. And at that point, guys, when we get there and we're not there, I'm not there. I can't speak for all of you, but I can't speak for me. I am not fully there. When, if I were to say the phrase all lives matter, I can honestly tell you I'm lying. I don't know 8 billion people. And my heart is not fully soft to all of them. There are some enemies out there that in my heart it wouldn't bother me if they were dead. And that's my heart problem. Verse 14, then, then, when the church is together, when the church is connected, when the church is in relationship, when that diverse community has learned how to love within itself, has learned how to bless within itself, has learned how to be inclusive within itself, then we will no longer be tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love. And, and I want to be clear about this speaking here. This speaking right here, we'll speak the truth in love, comes through our works of service and sometimes through our mouth. We will grow to become in every respect a mature body. Of him who is head, that is Christ. And from the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. Not builds itself up. Builds itself up in love. As each part does its work. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live like the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Can you not see, folks, how futile Thinking exists. Can you not see, folks, how Satan has us all in our pain, in our suffering, in our hurt, distracting us from the love of God, pushing us into sides, telling us you need to go over to the flesh because all that matters in this world is life, or, or you need to go over to God and take control of everything. You cannot live, guys. I cannot live in that mentality anymore. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardening of their hearts, folks, people have hard hearts out there. They've been hurt. It's on display for the world to see. Our country's hurts are on display for the world to see. 
My friends' hurts are on display for the world to see. My hurts right now are on display for the world to see, and I will be judged for them. And Paul does not end there. Paul continues in chapter 6, says this, Finally, as he's in prison, as he's locked up, as he's in the middle of suffering, as he's in the middle of suffering, not for the sins that he did in the past, not for killing Christians, not for murdering people who were doing good for God. He's not suffering for those sins. He's suffering for the sin of preaching love, of preaching unity, of preaching peoples can come together and they can be one. He's in prison for that. And as he's in prison for that, he says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take the stand against whose schemes? People schemes, other humans, political schemes, against the devil schemes. For our struggle, listen as I have listened, hopefully. Hear these words from Paul. These are Jesus' words. This is Jesus' life as he reaches down and he grabs the woman who's been caught in adultery, as he tells the parables of the Samaritans, as he reaches out for the kids. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That's the world's struggle. It can be solved with a bullet. It can be solved with violence. It can be solved if we destroy enough stuff, people's lives will change. It just makes harder hearts for the future. It passes it on to the next generation of pain and suffering so that we can never escape a generational cycle of pain and suffering that we all perpetuate because we don't believe what Paul says right here. We don't believe the life of Jesus. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers and authorities and the powers of darkness in this world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are being manipulated and not always for bad reasons from a world's perspective, but for horrible reasons in the kingdom. God wants us unified, and Satan wants us divided. And we find ourselves on social media buying into it. Paul says this, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may stand your ground. And after having done everything, stand firm. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with readiness, that comes from peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you see all this violent language in there. But when you understand that violent language, what you're seeing is spiritual armor for a spiritual foe. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me. I'm sad, guys. I'm hurt. I've had so many sermons running through my head this week. I've talked to so many people in pain, as you probably have as well. I'm hurt that this can, this is the type of stuff that divides God's kingdom. I'm hurt that pandemics, plagues, and violence, pain that hardens hearts will divide the kingdom of God. That's what I hurt for. That injustice and racism. That as this country around us rips us apart, that our Christian faith here in the West is so tied to the country, that as the country goes, so does Christianity. And that pains me. As Christians, as a pastor, I can't choose a side. As a therapist, when I sit there to help a a husband and wife who are struggling, or kids who are struggling with the parents, I can't choose a side. We're all trained to know that as soon as we choose a side, we lose our impartiality, we lose the respect of the other side, and we can no longer reconcile. 
Don't choose sides. Stand in the middle. Be the end. Hold the tension. My heart was broken as I watched a black police officer pour his heart out on his phone online yesterday. Talking about the pain of seeing his brother George Floyd on the ground being brutalized. The pain that he's felt for years. Seeing black people suffer at the hands of police officers. And as a cop, he's talking about the pain of how those cops have hurt his profession that he has worked so hard to try to reconcile. That he's worked his life to try to help bridge the gaps. And he cries. And I cried with him. When you choose a side, you reject good people on both sides. You reject bad people on both sides. You reject love because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You don't have the luxury anymore. I want to tell you one last thing because I've been long-winded today. But it's been the thought that has been rattling around my brain that I can't shake. Some of you may not feel this, but as a pastor, I feel it. I feel the weight. I feel that I take on too much. As a counselor, I've learned how to distance myself, but as a pastor, I can't do it. I just can't. I don't have freedom. Christians do not have freedom the way the world talks about freedom. We have freedom in Christ. Not freedom outside of Christ, not freedom from our country, not freedom from the person sitting next to me or the, or the person that's going to hate on me down the street or freedom from the police who are biased against me or, or, or freedom from school or freedom from anything in this world. We don't have freedom as Christians. We have freedom in Christ. And when you stay in Christ, guys, I'm going to be honest, it's hard on the front end, but that's where you're going to find the joy. When you reconcile the irreconcilable, when you bridge that which seems so broken to the world that they would rather push them in a corner, when you bring that love back, when you take the hardened heart and you turn it into hard skin and a soft heart, you got too many people in our faith with thin skin and hard hearts. And we got to flip that. I hurt with you, brothers and sisters. I hurt with my black brothers and sisters. And I hurt with all my other brothers and sisters who are hurting alongside of them, who are grieving the pain they feel. And I call you to this. I call you to stand where Christ stood. But I promise you that if you stand there long enough, if you hold your ground long enough, you will die. Kids, as you're listening to this, you may be slightly freaked out. You may be wondering, what's going on with Mr. Bo? Why is he so sad? I'm going to tell you why I'm sad, guys, because you've got to grow up in this world. Little Nick's kids, who I've loved since their birth, got to grow up in this world. My kids got to grow up in this world. The kids that have been running around this church who are on my mind right now got to grow up in this world, and they got to do the tough work that maybe the generation before us didn't do so well. And the generation before that, and the generation before that, and we got to pay for the sins of our fathers. But we can't get caught up in the solutions of our fathers as though those worked, because they didn't. We've got got to love, and loving is difficult. If you dare say to me, all lives matter, I will challenge you to prove it. I hope we could all get there. I hope that we could be like Christ as we are being executed by someone. Look down and say, God, forgive them. Father God, challenge our hearts. Break our hearts, Father God. Help us to love in the difficulty, to love in the pain, to love our enemy. Not love when it's easy, love when it's hard. To not have to feel like we have to have it all right to love. And to not feel... 
God tempted to step out of love to find an easy solution that will make us feel better. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that you give us that is the only way we can survive in this world and do what you've called us to do is through your Spirit, God. Thank you for that Spirit, God. Thank you for letting me feel that Spirit when I step so far outside of my own capacity. And I pray that others will do the same, that they will step so far out of their capacity, God, that they will feel your spirit, cover them, challenge them. And I pray that those around them will see love. They will not see anything but love. I pray that this world will look at Christians today, that will look at Christians now and say, I see God's love. I want to know God's love because the way of the world's not working. Father, help us love you and love others. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. So Good morning, church. It's so good to be together, uh, to be together virtually. It's good to have the opportunity to assemble, even if we have to do virtually, uh, that we can assemble together to praise, to honor, and to worship God, to be a part of his people uh, collectively, to be the community of faith, to, sh to shout to the world what we believe and who, who we are and who our great and glorious God is. Uh, many of you are aware that we have intended uh, to begin a soft opening to begin to meet together next uh, Sunday on the Ju uh, June 14th. Uh, many of you are also aware that that is not going to be possible. Uh, we've ordered equipment. It's still pending arrival. And so we will be waiting a few more weeks, it appears, before we'll be able to meet collectively again back here at the building. Uh, but we ask you to continue to be patient. Uh, we had did a survey, as m many of you are aware, and 95% uh, of you indicated that you could be patient until uh, we could both live stream and simulcast as we worship together. And so that is our intent. Hopefully it will only be a few more weeks before we can be together. Uh, Bo, thank you for uh, the lesson this morning. Thank you for what uh, it means to us and who we are and uh, what God calls us to, who God calls us to be. I'm reminded of the passage uh, in the 10th ch chapter of Luke, uh, beginning in verse 30. Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho 
when he fell uh, among uh, he, he, when he fell among thieves, uh, he was beaten, and uh, when they went away, they left him uh, near dead. Uh, a priest happened to be going by, and he, as he came down the road and saw him, he passed by on the other side. You know the story. In the same way, the Levite came by. And he also passed by on the other side. My brothers and sisters, my black brothers and sisters are fearful in our world, are fearful for their safety and for their lives in our country and in my own community and in my own city. This is not as it should be. This is not as God intends. This is what God wants. And God wants his people to stand up for what is good. This is not just about race. This is a, a battle uh, against the powers uh, of evil and of good in the world. And we stand on the side of good. We do not have to be fearful about standing on the side of what is good and standing against what is evil as Christians. That is God's intent. In fact, God's intent is clear. Uh, in Ephesians, from which uh, uh, both spoke this morning uh, in chapter 2, a couple of chapters uh, uh, before what he uh, read, this is what it, God's intent is. Uh, the scripture says in Ephesians 2, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, his intent, this is God's intent, was that uh, his intent is that now, not later, now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. It is now, and it is not from the leaders of our country. It is not from politicians. It is not from Facebook. It is not from voices in other parts of the world. It is God's intent, according to what Paul said, that now the rulers and authorities, even in the unseen world, let alone those in the seen world, the physical world in which we live, will be informed of God's wisdom by the church. Not the elders, not the ministers, by the church. The church, everyone who hears my voice today, we stand against evil. May God bless us as we stand with him against the forces and powers of evil. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray this morning that you would uh, bless us as we stand against evil throughout the world. And specifically as we can uh, consider the uh, evil that is racism and that has uh, brought about the death of uh, many, including Floyd George. Lord, we, uh, George Floyd, we, we, we pray that you would... Uh, bless all of us uh, as we stand against evil, as we stand against racism, and as we stand against the, the powers, uh, the unseen powers in the world, as well as the seen powers that are evil. And Lord, may you bless us, and may you give us the strength and power to stand up for what is right. And Lord, may you also forgive us when we are silent like the priest and the Levite who passes by on the other side and allows injustice and evil to exist in our world. May your name be praised in everything we do. It is in Jesus Christ's name that we pray this prayer. Amen.
sé.